Join with me in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus the Nazarene. The one who grew up in Galilee, there in Nazareth. Yet it had been prophesied of old that he would be called a Nazarene. It wasn't a great name from a great city. Yet he was the greatest man. He was the Son of God. And Father, we thank you that indeed his love for us is wonderful. It's marvellous that he would love us and would give himself for us. And although the journey in an earthly sense began in Bethlehem, the plan and purpose had been in the mind and the heart of God from before creation. And we thank you for that redemption that is ours and how we pray that even now as we would turn our minds and our hearts to your word that we would hear you speak. We ask it, Father, by your grace. We ask it for your glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Friends, as we turn to this passage that fills in for us really what happens after the shepherds have gone from the stable. Jesus and his mother and Joseph have been moved into some more appropriate accommodation, though still, I'm sure, basic. The wise men have come. But of course... Herod's desire for them to come and tell him where the child was that he might worship was, of course, a nonsense. There was only one king, and that king was Herod, as far as he was concerned. And everything that we read of in the Christmas story, the stable, the house, the wise men, the angelic visitations to Mary, to Joseph, to the shepherds. They still continue. The wise men have departed by a different route. And an angel once again appears to Joseph in a dream. Rise, take the child and his mother and flee. It's a, a specific command. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. There is already a, 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 an unavoidable sense in their minds that this child is precious. This child is special. This child has come about by a miracle, by the, not only the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit, but heralded by angels. And now they're being told they must flee. They must flee. Because Herod is bent on the child being killed. Remember when we read earlier there in Matthew chapter 2, Herod was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. It's often been pointed out that, of course, Jerusalem was disturbed. Because when Herod was disturbed, no one knew what might happen next. So barbaric, so awful, so unpredictable, this man. This man who had his wife murdered because he thought she was a threat. This man who had sons murdered, not all of them, but some of them, if he considered that they were a threat. And now a king of the Jews, but not him. What a dreadful action. What a dreadful man to wish to do that. Yet we're told 
here in these verses that even this was fulfilling a prophecy. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. And indeed, that's what precisely God had done. He had called his ancient people out of Egypt. They had gone there as, as captives. Well, they hadn't gone as captives. They'd gone as guests. But the Bible tells us that there arose a generation. There arose a Pharaoh who did not know of Joseph. Did not know what Joseph had done for Egypt. And those people who had come, as it were, as guests were made slaves till God redeemed them and brought them out of Egypt. You see, in the fulfilling of this prophecy, we see a sign of redemption. That's what God did as he brought his people out of Egypt. He redeemed them from Egypt. But Egypt paid a price. Price of the death of all the firstborn on that Passover night. But God brought his people out. He preserved those people whose trust was in him. And the sign of redemption, going back perhaps 1,500 years, is a sign that is echoed in the words of Matthew, that once again, there would be a mighty sign of redemption as God would call his son out of Egypt. So a specific command, fulfilling prophecy and pointing towards redemption. But secondly this morning, a dreadful holocaust. A dreadful holocaust revealing the wickedness of man and behind that wickedness a refusal to acknowledge Jesus as the true king. We use the word holocaust. And of course that word in our minds most specifically speaks of the death of more than six million Jewish people during Adolf Hitler's regime. But the word technically refers to, to any great loss of life, particularly a, a loss of life brought about by violence. And Herod played exactly to character, for when he discovered these men were not going to come and tell him where the specific baby was, Herod's awful plan was simply to kill every child under two within the region. You see, the time span that had been given by the wise men suggests that they'd been travelling for quite some time. Caused Herod to imagine that this child is somewhere between newborn and, and infancy, a toddler. So he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in that region. Some have suggested perhaps a number in the 20s, the 30s or into the hundreds. There has been conjecture and certainly conjecture without any basis that some would say, oh, perhaps even 64,000 or 144,000 but those were simply attempts to try and align figures with other aspects of biblical prophecy, but unrelated to this. We, we honestly don't know how many. But for every home that was devastated by his cruelty, devastated by his actions, there was weeping. There was crying. There was mourning. How awful it was. And Matthew, inspired by God's Spirit, calls to mind words from Jeremiah chapter 31. A voice heard in Rama, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel, Rachel, Jacob's wife, weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. What a life Rachel had had. 
not an easy life. How dreadful the day, for instance, the news came. The day the news came and said that Joseph was dead. The brothers, not always in the best of relationships. Yet, Matthew takes that event and he ties that event in to what is happening here. The people, the mothers weeping for their children because they are no more. They are no more. The immediate context when Jeremiah uses this language is the coming exile. When a wicked king would come and would rule over the people. Why? Because they had rejected God as the one who they would live under. Rejected him as, as their true king. And now in the story of Jesus, there is a wicked king. Not the true king. Who is seeking to destroy the true king. The king who would come and be born of, of a virgin. The king of kings. The lord of lords. And although so many would follow him through his earthly years of teaching, the time would come when the majority would turn against him and, and say, we will not have this king rule over us. No. No. How awful that the king of glory, the king of eternity would, would come and in love and compassion reveal himself to men. And then a crowd would cry, Barabbas. We want Barabbas. What shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him. Oh, the heart of man is wicked. Wicked. Yet of those who will come and see the Lord Jesus as, as their true king, they will discover that there is no greater king, there is no better king, there is no kinder king. And when we bring our lives under his lordship, we have peace, we have nothing to fear. Sometimes our lives are in a mess because why? We're running them ourselves. We're not prepared as it were to say, look, I'm going to get out of this seat and let, let God take control of my life. Why? Because just like Herod, we want to be in control of our own little kingdoms. We want to control our own destiny. And that is understandable if there was not a God who is kind and God who is loving and a God who is wise and a God who is just. But when we come to realize that there is and he gave his own son for us so that the sin that separates us from him can be dealt with, we can be brought into relationship with him where we are able to call him our father and he is able to call us his children to live under his lordship. That is what we are able to do when we come and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ when we see him for who he is the true king and come in gratitude and bow the knee before him what stops us doing that? pride desire to have our own way many things But whilst this beautiful story of the coming of the Lord Jesus, the glorious hope that it brings, brings joy to those who will see him as king and trust him and entrust themselves to him for those who stand against him. Oh, there is the horror. There is the hardness of hearts revealed. 
Oh, but such men don't last forever, do they? And the time came when Herod died and an angel of the Lord again appears in a dream to Joseph and saying, the one who sought the child's life, those who sought his life are dead. You can go to the land of Israel. So he did. But then he heard something that really troubled him. Really troubled him. Yes, Herod was dead. But when Herod died, his rule was given to three of his sons. I don't know all of their names. I guess I could have found it, but the names of the other two isn't really relevant to us. Just our careless. If Herod was bad, Archelaus was worse. In order for Archelaus to show the people that he had to be obeyed, he began his reign in Judea by slaughtering 3,000 people who he, considered, who he considered to be his opponents. He was wicked. In fact, he was so wicked that after only a few short years, the Roman authorities removed him. Because the people cried out. They could not live under such wickedness. Yet living in their land at that time. As an infant. A young boy who will grow. And he is the true king. He is the good king. He would go, he would live in a city called Nazareth. We would know absolutely nothing about him until at 12 years of age he goes up to Jerusalem with his parents and, and we begin to see more than a glimmer of his own understanding of who he is and why he's here. But in those early years, he simply lives at Bethlehem and labours. And so the Saviour, Saviour of the world has come. But he would leave Nazareth. He would embark upon his earthly ministry of, of work, of witness. The works and the signs would declare him to be the Messiah. His own words would declare him as such. And then the king who Herod tried to kill would one day be nailed to a Roman cross. And there he would die. No longer Herod behind this, no the religious leaders behind this. Yet as Peter reminds us in Acts chapter 2, although it was wicked men who carried out the act, it was God said, well and purpose, why? Because just as he had brought his people out of Egypt, he had brought his son to this world to bring redemption to those who would trust in him. Friends, the Christmas story, Calvary story, is all redemption story. A God who redeems his people, a God who himself pays that price of redemption so that we can know his forgiveness, so we can know his joy, joy so we can know his peace. I want to ask you today, do you know that peace in your heart? And some of you may say, well, I wish I did. But I don't. Let me ask you another question. Who's king of your heart? As long as you're king, or as long as you're almost, as it were, power sharing with God, You'll never know true peace. But once we acknowledge his lordship, once we acknowledge that he is king and seek by God's spirit to enthrone him in our lives, then peace becomes that wonderful reality, that wonderful hope within. Friends, you could leave this Christmas season 
knowing the Christ of Christmas, knowing the hope that Christmas brings. For Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again, but until he comes, he has not left us as orphans. But the Father has sent the Holy Spirit to empower us, to enable us, to equip us, to live lives that bring him glory. And there's no more peaceful place than to be in the center of God's will and purpose in obedience to him. I pray you're in that place, dear ones, to find that place. Come to Christ. Put your trust in Christ. Rest in Christ. Let him be not just your Christmas home, but your everlasting hope. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the good news of Christmas. We want to thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, God became flesh, has dwelt among us. We have seen your glory. And you bring us peace. Oh, may we know that peace, Father, we ask. May we know not only that peace, but may we know that sense of wonder, that sense of amazement in your grace and in your love that comes to those whose trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who left his throne. The one who came to earth. The one who even now is watching over. This is what we ask, Lord, that we might know your peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, friends, let's close this service of worship by singing, Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown.